NJACS NMR Topical Group. And this is our annual symposium uh, that we do every year. And I'm Guy Monteleone. I'm at Rensselaer Polytech Institute. And I've been involved with NJACS for over 30 years on and off. And I currently uh, kind of an advisor together at Luciano. Um, and I want to thank uh, the great speakers that we put to that, that have come together for this meeting to take the time. It's, uh, it's too bad we can't be in person. But on the other hand, doing it remotely allows a, 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 a more extensive group to be involved, which is great. And I particularly want to thank Bradley Falk, uh, who's the chair this year, and John Williams, the co-chair, who have done a really great job of organizing the symposium and all the work putting this together. So, so thank you very much, Bradley and John. Um, so the NJACS, uh, we are, it, it aims to foster academic industry interactions. Um, we have monthly evening meetings, and it's done in the evening so it's convenient for people in, in industry. Mm -hmm. industry. And, and the echo now, something got turned on that caused an echo. And, um, and actually the way it works is we have a rotating chair. Uh, so we have a chair for a year with a co-chair who organize things. And then each year we identify a new co-chair for the next year and they have the year after they become the chair. So we're actually looking for a co-chair uh, for, the, for, the, for next year. If you're interested, you should talk, contact Bradley or John about that. So, um, so we're very uh, honored to have uh, Professor Lewis Kay as our, our speaker today. Uh, uh, Pro uh, Lewis is actually a university professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, he, he has made major high impact contributions and methods and applications of solution state NMR in biomolecular biophysics and structural biology and developed many of the key techniques and pulse sequences that we all use for protein NMR, biomolecular NMR in general, assignment structures and dynamics, things like gradient enhanced HSQC and applications of coherent selection and triple resonance NMR. And Lewis has been particularly generous in sharing and disseminating these technologies to the broad community. Um, so uh, he, he's always willing to help and generous and has provided various avenues to share his technologies. He's been particularly a pioneer in developing methods for studies of larger proteins by solution NMR, Exclu uh, developing both unique isotope labeling methods, uh, deuteration with methyl labeling, which when I first heard of it, I said, wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of work. And now it's just standard and routine. And novel experimental methods like methyl trosy and cess, which were widely adopted by the NMR community. And he's applied these to very large systems like multiple synthase, synthase 700 amino acids and multiple assemblies of the proteasome. Uh, so Lewis got his bachelor's degree at the University of Alberta did his PhD at Yale with Jim Prestigard and then postdoctoral work at NIH, uh, particularly with Ad Bax, but also with Marius Klor and Angela Gronenborn. People may not know, but he actually spent a sabbatical uh, about a year with Luciano Mueller at BMS in New Jersey um, before going on to the University of Toronto, where he's now professor of molecular genetics, biochemistry, and chemistry, and university professor. Uh, Lewis has been awarded numerous awards, uh, elected to the Royal Society of Canada, the Royal Society of London, the Corona Prize of the Royal Society of Chemistry, and most recent, and, and the university professor, Founders Medal of the uh, ICMRBS. So uh, a little bit long-winded introduction, I'm sorry, Lewis. Uh, the title of his talk is developing the NMR toolkit to study protein molecules in the phase separated state. Lewis. Uh, well, thank you very much, Guy, for that wonderful uh, introduction and also for the invitation to speak here uh, today. Can you can you all see the first slide, NMR tools to prophase separation? It looks good. Great. So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. In fact, is uh, the development of NMR methods that allow us to look at phase separation in the liquid state, in particular from an atomistic point of view. We want to understand the forces that are responsible for driving phase separation, and we want to be able to do so on a uh, per amino acid basis and really get out detailed information if we can. Now, phase separation is something that is actually pretty old. Anybody who's uh, 
had a, a salad recently and used an oil and a vinegar salad dressing, recognizes the fact that one gets uh, separation of phases. Here we have the oil in a dark black brown sort of floating around a sea of uh, a vinegar. Uh, but perhaps what's uh, less well appreciated is the fact that one can have uh, membraneless uh, organelles in the cell. These uh, membraneless organelles are going to concentrate uh, biomolecules like proteins and nucleic acids. And this is really important to regulate metabolism and biological function. Uh, it also provides, of course, a bridge between cell biology and biophysics. And therefore, uh, really, it allows the biophysicist uh, a, a point of addressing uh, important aspects of cell uh, biology. And in particular, it begs the question as to what molecular interactions are going to be responsible for stabilizing biomolecules in uh, these droplets. And today, what I want to talk about is one particular protein, which is called Caprin-1. It's one of many proteins that is actually found in so-called stress granules and pea bodies. These are membraneless organelles that are involved in the sequestration of RNA and play an important role in RNA metabolism and in controlling translation. So that once one has uh, RNA inside of these uh, P-bodies or stress granules, one gets uh, uh, the uh, translation stalling. And then when these granules melt away in response to some sort of stimulus, one can resume translation. Uh, one can generate uh, proteins that are uh, responsible as receptors for various signals. And this is important uh, in neuronal function, in uh, memory, in learning, and in autism. So Caprin-1 is a 709 residue protein, but what's particularly germane for the talk today is that the C-terminal 100 residues are going to be able to phase separate. These uh, C-terminal 100 residues are uh, made up of quite a few arginine, something like 15. There's a net charge of plus 13 at physiological pH, a PI of 11.5. So we'd like to be able to understand the Caprin molecule, in particular in the phase-separated state, as a first step towards uh, understanding the forces that are responsible for phase uh, separation. And so the goal is really to develop a suite of very sensitive and simple NMR uh, experiments for studies uh, in the phase-separated state. And the first question that we asked ourselves uh, really is what sort of NMR experiments need to be developed? What residue should we target? Uh, this may be specific to the system in hand on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, we want to uh, target enough residues that there's going to be some generality as we go to uh, different systems. And we wanted to keep things very simple. So our initial goal was to, let's say, add a perturbant to a solution of a, of a protein, of Caprin in this particular case. We're going to add a perturbant that changes the phase separation capabilities, perhaps making it more likely to phase separate. But we're going to work in a, a mixed state. So in a non-phase separated state, we're going to add a perturbant that pushes it towards phase separation without taking it to phase separation. This allows us to ver get very uh, high quality spectra. And then we're going to study various properties in that mixed uh, phase sample. Uh, for example, we're going to monitor changes to intermolecular NOEs. Maybe certain intermolecular NOEs are going to increase when we add uh, this perturbant, and that would indicate that uh, there are certain interactions that would manifest likely in the phase-separated state. And so we want to build new NMR methodologies around the residue types that are particularly affected when we add this perturbant. So the question is, in the context of Caprin-1, what sort of perturbant should we add which will push the system towards phase separation? And in uh, this uh, upper left-hand panel here, I indicate sort of a poor man's way of uh, generating a, a phase diagram where along the y-axis I plot the ATP concentration, along the x-axis is the concentration of Caprin, and these are results that are obtained uh, from an assay of phase separation, a fluorescence imaging assay, where these pink dots correspond to various concentrations of ATP and Caprin, which are phase separated. And the X indicates uh, a lack of phase separation. And so we're able to measure phase separation in this sense through uh, the use of, of fluorescence, where we have a small fraction of Caprin molecules, which are labeled with an Alexa 647 dye, which fluoresces uh, uh, purple, if you like, a small amount of ATP is going to be labeled with uh, a fluorophore that's green. And you can see that these balls here, which correspond uh, to images of phase-separated droplets, 
the purple balls correspond to the same regions of where we have the green balls. And this is the merge spectrum, if you like, indicating uh, where we have both ATP and caprin in the phase separated milieu. So you can see that ATP and caprin are going to co-phase separate. And from these sorts of images, we can get a, a, a two dimensional uh, phase separation uh, diagram. And so we know that ATP is going to promote phase separation. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a caprin sample initially. We're going to add a little bit of ATP sort of before we get phase separation. And we're going to ask questions, for example, where does the ATP bind to caprin to induce ultimately phase separation when we have a high enough concentration? Now, we'd like to be able to uh, work at um, concentrations that are, um, again, below the phase separation, but at a high enough uh, pH because uh, caprin is going to uh, be, we want caprin to be in its physiological uh, charge, which is roughly minus four. So we're going to have to work at pH seven and a half or eight or so. And what that means is that the typical NH experiments that we would normally do are going to uh, fail. And so what we're going to do is we're going to record experiments whereby we transfer magnetization from H alpha to C alpha and then subsequently record CON experiments, carbonyl and nitrogen experiments and then transfer back to H alpha for observation. So these are the typical con experiments, if you like, but they're of higher sensitivity because they involve H alpha detection. Uh, they're done in water samples. And so we're going to rely on the fact that we have uh, triple axis uh, gradient probes to be able to get really excellent water suppression. And so what I show here is a volume ratio of peaks that we obtain in this experiment where, for example, we have uh, ATP magnesium at, say, a concentration of 1.6 millimolar. We add a touch of manganese, which is paramagnetic, and uh, we then record spectra in the presence of the manganese or in the absence. And that's shown here with these black dots where we have volume ratios, for example, of the arginine rich region of our spectra or for aromatic rich regions. So caprin is divided into arginine rich regions of the spectra, aromatic rich regions, and you can see that uh, there is going to be predominantly a decrease in volume ratio for the arginine rich regions of the spectra when we include uh, manganese. Now, if we just have manganese by itself, so a free manganese control, you can see in green that manganese really doesn't interact with caprin. So that when we see a decrease in the volumes, that's associated with manganese when it binds with ATP. So it's what we're really probing here is the sites of interaction of ATP with the caprin molecule. And you can see that that's predominantly at the arginine rich regions of the protein. The arginine rich regions are positively charged. You can see that on the sliding charge index, which I indicate here. And in the middle region, which is highly aromatic and not positively charged, you can see that there's less interaction. So caprin is a good uh, small molecule to sort of push the system towards phase separation. And then what we're going to do again on a, a non-phase separated sample is we're going to record uh, experiments both in the presence and absence of ATP to try to uh, establish how it is that ATP is able to push the system towards phase separation. What are the interactions? that are going to be important on route to phase separation to aid us in the development of the NMR experiments that we want to be able to do subsequently. So schematically, what we want to do is simply measure intermolecular NOE, say between this black chain shown here and this uh, red uh, chain shown here. The black chain is going to be C13 labeled. The red chain is going to be C12 labeled. And we're going to invoke edited filter type of experiments and record 3D uh, nosy based uh, correlations to get out information. So this is one such uh, 2D plane from the three dimensional data set, which shows uh, NOE interactions between uh, glycine H alphas and the aromatic proton side chains, both without ATP and with ATP. And you can clearly see that the interactions increase upon the addition of ATP. The red NOE peaks are stronger than the blue ones. We can also show if we look at, say, arginine H deltas, these are a uh, correlation map between the H delta protons to, again, aromatic protons. And you can see that the red 
uh, NOE peaks are significantly stronger than the uh, blue ones. We can uh, also look at uh, H-alpha NOEs, both in the non-glycine uh, H-alphas and in glycine H-alphas. And again, you can see that in the presence of ATP, those NOEs are much stronger towards uh, aromatic protons. So we have intermolecular contacts that involve H-alphas, both those that are associated with glycine and non-glycine residues. We have uh, NOEs that are associated with uh, H-deltas of arginine, so arginine side chains with aromatic side chains that are going to be increased uh, as we progress towards phase separation. So these sorts of spectra are the type that we and others have recorded. They provide amino acid type information. We know that arginines are important, aromatic residues are important, but they don't really give us residue specific information. What amino acids are gonna be those that are significant? And that's really what we would like to be able to get. So we wanna design experiments that are going to uh, give us uh, that information. And let me just illustrate some of the challenges that are associated with getting that information. When we think about intrinsically disordered regions of proteins, or we think about intrinsically disordered proteins uh, in the dilute phase, we can of course envision uh, a whole plethora of different experiments which rely on the fact that the T2s are gonna be very long. And so we can transfer magnetization all over the place. And despite the fact that we don't perhaps have very good resolution in our spectra, we have tremendous amount of overlap, we nevertheless can tease out the information that we need through magnetization transfer-based uh, experiments. These experiments are very difficult to do in the phase-separated milieu. This is just illustrated in the context of Caprin here. This is the N15 uh, backbone R2 values shown here in blue as a function of residue number. And you can see that whilst there, are a, there is a variation in the R2 values, they can be quite high on the order of 20 or 30 per second. And translated into a spectral density analysis, we see S squared tau C, v, tau C values on the order of 15 nanoseconds on average for the condensed phase, the phase separated Caprin milieu at 40 degrees. By contrast, if we have a mixed state, so that's a non-phase separated state of the same molecule, even if we go down to four degrees, uh, the J of zero values are quite a bit lower so that we have uh, a, a long-lived magnetization that can uh, essentially tolerate transfers uh, in various complicated pulse sequences. We don't have that luxury available to us. And this is just uh, emphasized here where I show some results from diffusion experiments where we're looking at dilute phase or condensed phase of Caprin. And you can see differences in diffusion constants of two orders of magnitude, uh, increased uh, diffusion rates uh, for the dilute phase. And a, a diffusion constant of something like uh, 10 to the minus eight centimeters squared per second, which is what we get for the Caprin moieties within the context of a phase separated uh, state are sort of the, the numbers that one would get for an E. coli cell diffusing at room temperature. So we have molecules that diffuse very, very slowly. Uh, that creates problems uh, for doing ultra high resolution uh, NMR in a sensitive way. Now, what we want to be able to do is we want to look for intermolecular NOEs. So what we would like to be able to do then is to prepare a sample that is protonated C13 labeled, N14 labeled, that's the black uh, strand. And then we want to have another sample that is going to be C12 and N15 so that we can uh, generate NOEs from the black to the red and record backbone amide correlations that report on interactions between the black and the uh, red uh, chains. And the red chain we're also going to deuterate. So it's gonna be deuterated C12 and N15. And I wanna just describe why we uh, wanna use deuteration. That's of course quite obvious to solution-based uh, big molecule NMR people. You can see that at, uh, the deuterated N15 proton correlation map shown here at a gigahertz, the corresponding proton correlation map shown here again at a gigahertz. So this is a deuterated sample. This is a protonated sample of Caprin. And you can see that there is significantly better resolution, which deuteration affords. 
Due duration also uh, affords a significant increase in sensitivity when one uses TROSI-based experiments that essentially uh, in, in make use of cross-correlation effects between dipole and CSA. So we have an average intensity gain associated with due duration of about a factor of 1.7. So in terms of resolution and sensitivity, we have significant uh, gains that are afforded by due duration, and we're all familiar with this. But in fact, there are other reasons, uh, as important reasons, for why we have to uh, uh, invoke due duration. And for example, as I mentioned, we're interested in intermolecular NOEs to get out distance information about uh, proximal chains. Uh, and we want to avoid intra-NOEs, which of course would be artifacts in these sorts of experiments. So let's look at the black chain here, which is going to be protonated C13 and N14 labeled. If we have an intra-NOE, and again, we're looking at NOEs between protons that are coupled to C13 to backbone amides, well, an intra-NOE uh, in this particular case would involve uh, amide protons that are associated with an N15 nitrogen that in the uh, natural abundance nitrogen case corresponds to only 0.3% of the molecules. So we're able to avoid uh, intra-NOE simply by not putting uh, N15 in the black chain. The situation's a bit more complicated for the red chain. Again, we're interested in intermolecular NOEs, so we want NOEs between proton, protons that are coupled to C13 and backbone amide N15 uh, proton, protons. Uh, in this particular case, we have N15 label, where we have a C12 label chain, so we'll, we're down by 1%. But that means that 1% of the molecules would show intramolecular NOEs. Now, intramolecular NOEs are going to be a lot stronger than intermolecular NOEs in the uh, Capron case. Indeed, that's the case for uh, all IDPs. And that's problematic because we have essentially the possibility, therefore, for intramolecular NOEs. We're only down by a factor of 100 because we're relying on the lack of C13 labeling here. And therefore, we decided to replace uh, the aliphatic and aromatic protons in the red uh, chain case with deuterons. And in so doing, we would ensure that any NOEs that we've seen, we see from uh, protons associated with aliphatic or aromatic car carbons to backbone amides essentially is an intermolecular uh, interaction. And we've verified that through many controls. Now, because we're looking at the backbone amides, we're going to carry out these experiments at pH uh, 5.5, where the amide spectrum, as you can see, is still of high quality. Now, another question is, what magnetic field should we work at for carrying out these experiments? That may seem to be a, sort of an academic question. Uh, you might think, well, just use the highest magnetic field. But we were worried that if we had conformational exchange, for example, in these systems, perhaps a gigahertz would not be uh, the uh, optimum field. Well, it turns out that a gigahertz, at least in our hands, uh, is optimal. That's the highest field that we have available uh, for the Capron system. And you can clearly see uh, the improvement in resolution that is afforded when one goes from 600 megahertz to a gigahertz. What temperature should we work, work at when we carry out these experiments? Uh, and to answer that question, we uh, generated proper phase diagrams that are shown here, uh, temperature versus Capron concentration. Now, what I show in this uh, little panel here is going to be the NMR sample that we prepared, where we have the condensed phase, which uh, settles to uh, below the uh, region of the dilute phase in our NMR sample. And we have our coil, which is focused only on the condensed phase. But for the purposes of generating phase diagrams, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of our sample from the dilute phase, a little bit from the condensed phase. We're going to measure the concentrations of protein in each of the phases at a given temperature to generate uh, these profiles that you see here. And we're going to repeat the profiles as a function of sodium chloride to get a salt dependence, which is shown in uh, the various colors. We've decided to work at 400 millimolar sodium chloride which has an upper critical temperature of phase separation of roughly 55 degrees. So what that means is that anywhere inside here is going to be phase separated. If we go above 55 degrees, 
uh, there is no phase separation. We go to a, a mixed sample. But demixing is going to occur below 55 degrees. We're going to work at 40 degrees to ensure that we're well within the uh, phase separation boundaries. Now, you can see as a function of increasing salt as we go from 200 millimolar to generate this bottom curve up to 600 millimolar to generate the top curve, phase separation propensity is going to increase. Why is that? It's because caprin is a highly charged uh, protein. It's highly positively charged. And the sodium chloride is going to act as a screen. It screens out the uh, electrostatic interactions, which are unfavorable for bringing molecules together in the phase separated milieu. So as you go to higher concentrations of sodium chloride, you get rid of more of the non-favorable interactions, hence the favorable interactions that exist between the chains that manifest by virtue of the of the side chain side chain and side chain backbone content uh, interactions. These become stronger and therefore phase separation is going to uh, be enhanced. So we enhance phase separation through uh, the addition of salt. So now what we want to do is based on the original experiments that were uh, generated through the addition of perturbant, where we learned, for example, that arginines are important, that aromatics are important, that surprisingly uh, backbones, in particular H-alpha contacts, are going to be important. We want to design experiments whereby we select for magnetization of a particular type on the black chain and then transfer it to the red chain. So what I show here in this one dimensional spectrum at the top is a uh, proton spectrum that is recorded of all the protons in caprin that are a one bond coupled to C13. So it's a C13 edited spectra. What I show here is a spectrum that we generate where we focus on the arginine H delta. So the side chains of arginines through the H deltas, which are an important uh, moiety for a phase separation. And you can see uh, this is these are peaks that are associated with arginine. There's a little bit of residual lysine H epsilon that we're not able to separate. In this 1D situation, we have our non-glycine H alphas, our glycine H alphas, our serine H betas. We're interested in looking at serine side chains because of the hydroxy moiety. We want to examine uh, the role, if there is one, of hydrogen uh, bonds in the context of phase separation. And then uh, the important role of aromatics, which was brought out in our studies with the ATP perturbant. Uh, we want to be able to focus on these. So these uh, are one-dimensional experiments which indicate that we can select for particular residue types in the black chain and then relay the magnetization very simply to the red chain to record site-specific information about the destination of uh, the uh, magnetization. So how do we carry out these experiments? Well, we have to be quite careful. And the reason that we have to be quite qu careful is because line widths in the phase separated state are fairly broad. So we don't have a lot of time on our hands to play games with uh, magnetization transfer. So some, a simple example of, of how one would uh, carry out an experiment would be in the context of selecting for aromatic uh, moieties, aromatic protons or methyl group protons. Uh, what we would do uh, in the case of, of, of those protons is we would transfer magnetization, say, from proton to C13, and we would use a selective pulses on the carbon that are either selected for aromatic carbons or methyl carbons. We can then record the carbon chemical shift if we want, or not at all, transfer magnetization back to uh, the aromatic uh, proton, and then transfer further to the backbone amide. So this is a very simple example of how we would deal with aromatics or methyls. Uh, more complicated examples would be, say, if we wanted to transfer magnetization from non-glycine H-alphas to backbone amides of a different chain. How do we go about doing that? Well, we have an inept transfer that takes us from H-alpha to C-alpha, and because we don't want glycine H-alphas involved, we're going to make use of uh, selective uh, decoupling during the uh, inept transfer. And this selective decoupling is going to prevent the transfer of magnetization from glycine H-alphas in this case, also from threonine uh, H-betas because the uh, decoupling is selective for the carbons of C-alpha carbons of glycine, the C-beta carbon of threonine. And then when we have longitudinal order, we're going to apply selective pulses that are going to selectively invert the C-alpha of non-glycine amino acids in 
a successive scans with a successive inversion of the phase of the receiver. And we're also going to select against, in this particular case, proline H, data, H deltas and serine H betas, which uh, otherwise might leak through. So we uh, carry out a, a series of uh, functionalities, if you like, that select against and for various uh, particular spins that are of interest. And we carry out the selection when we have magnetization parked along the longitudinal uh, axis, so along the z-axis where relaxation is uh, less of a problem, so longitudinal order, or when we have to carry out uh, transfers of magnetization in any event. So we try to kill two birds with one stone, as is done during uh, this inept uh, portion shown here. And that allows us to get a really quite efficient and highly sensitive uh, editing filtering schemes. For example, if we look at the carbon proton correlation map, without any uh, editing filtering. So this is the typical correlation map of an HSQC, uh, for example, of, uh, of Caprin, where you can see all of the correlations. If we go down by a factor of 2.5 in our contour level and focus on the aromatics, here you see those. If we focus on the arginine H deltas, here's the arginine H delta with, again, a little bit of uh, a lysine H epsilon breakthrough, uh, we get uh, serine H betas or non-glycine H alphas or glycine H alphas. And we get these uh, desired protons with a selectivity that, uh, or sensitivity that varies from roughly 85 to 95%. And by sensitivity, I mean, we take the sensitivity of this peak here in the selected uh, spectrum and we compare it to the uh, corresponding sensitivity in the non-selected experiment. So we lose very little from doing these uh, uh, selective uh, pulses because we apply uh, them during uh, periods where relaxation is not going to be terribly limiting. So now we can record our NOE-based intermolecular uh, type of experiments. And I show here one such example. Again, this is all work on Caprin. So we're looking at uh, intermolecular NOEs, which uh, extend from the uh, aromatic protons of phenylalanines and tyrosines. We do not have uh, any other aromatic uh, types in this particular molecule to backbone amides of uh, adjacent uh, polypeptide chains. What I show here in black, and these are different regions of the same spectrum, but what I show in black is just the normal HSQC spectrum to sort of guide your eye. And then in red, what I show are the corresponding uh, NOE uh, correlation. So the red spectrum is the intermolecular uh, uh, NOEs that are derived from the pulse sequence, which transfers magnetization, in this case, from the aromatics to the amides. And what you can see is there's a variability in the intensity of the NOEs. We can see uh, NOEs in a site-specific manner to the destination amides, but of course, it's not site-specific from the origination. So we, these are uh, NOEs from uh, all potential phenylalanines and, and tyrosines to specific backbone amides. You can see that the NOEs uh, from the uh, aromatic protons to the backbone uh, amide uh, aromatic uh, uh, protons are quite intense. NOEs can be intense to arginines in some cases, in some cases not. They're not terribly intense to asparagines or serines, uh, but they tend to be quite uh, intense to glutamines. And you can see that threonines, the intensity is a little bit more than serines, and some glycines show NOEs and some do not. The fact that we see NOEs that are more intense to glutamines than asparagines is in keeping with the fact that uh, polyglutamine uh, repeats in various types of uh, protein systems are responsible for aggregation. So glutamine amino acids tend to be uh, more uh, aggregation prone, if you like, than asparagines. We also can conclude from this study that uh, tyrosines are going to give rise to uh, increased NOEs relative to phenylalanines. And to get that information, we've done an experiment whereby we record the carbon chemical shift of the origination and then the backbone amide proton uh, shift of the destination sites. And you can see that uh, these peaks here, corresponding to this big hump and this big hump, come from tyrosine. And the corresponding smaller humps come from phenylalanine. So tyrosines are, if you like, a little bit more sticky than phenylalanines in the context of uh, phase separation for Caprin. We can carry out additional experiments. Here's looking at arginine H deltas to uh, amides in an intermolecular manner, and we can uh, 
get out uh, information about uh, the destination sites, again, of, of magnetization. So what we've done is we've measured these five different sensitive experiments, uh, which allow us for each particular destination site, for example, here, tyrosine 662 or phenylalanine 643, to get out uh, information uh, about uh, the magnetization transfer uh, in, from various uh, protons, non-glycine H-alphas, aromatic H-alphas, and so forth. And then we can plot that uh, NOE intensity as a function of residue number for the various experiments. So for example, this is our aromatic-based experiment. There are 48 such uh, protons, aromatic uh, proton, side chain protons that give rise to NOEs to the backbone amides. Now, what we've done here is we've normalized the intensity. So what I'm showing you are the NOE intensities, if you like, the red NOE intensities divided by the black NOE or the black intensities that are the HSQC uh, intensities. And in so doing, we subtract out contributions from, for example, exchange uh, and also from hydrogen exchange that might attenuate uh, given peaks that is not related at all to proximity uh, between uh, pairs of interacting chains. So we have normalized intensities, and these intensities are typically three orders of magnitude or so smaller than the intensities of the HSQC cross peak. So we're talking about really very small, weak, transient interactions. Now, it turns out that whether we look at the NOEs involving arginines or non-glycines or glycines, you can see that there are certain trends. There are certain uh, regions of the backbone where there are going to be, if you like, hotspots, uh, where there are increases in the intensities. And we interpret these hotspots as indicating positions along backbone chains, which are going to be more sticky, more interactive uh, in generating uh, phase separated. Uh, state. So this is information all about the phase separated state and it indicates to us that there are particular uh, hot spots. Now, if what I say is true, if these are truly NOE hot spots that really reflect intermolecular interactions, then we should be able to modify the intermolecular interactions and hence phase separation through the introductions of mutations in this region. So if we were to introduce a mutation, say in the green strip here, which is uh, one of the hot spots, or in the orange strip here, another hot spot, or in the blue strip here, another hot spot, then the idea would be that we will have potentially decreased intermolecular interactions, since that's what we believe the NOEs are reporting on, and hence we would decrease the propensity to phase separate. And so what we've done is we've made polypeptide chains with a single uh, set of uh, mutations uh, in either the blue region or the orange region or the green region, and then we've assayed for phase separation uh, propensity. And the way that we've add, assayed for phase separation propensity is we've measured scattering, OD600, as a function of sodium chloride concentration. Now, remember that I mentioned that caprin is going to be highly positive charged. Sodium chloride is going to screen those positive charges and allow for phase separation to occur. So if what we've done is remove some of the interactions that promote phase separation, say between aromatic side chains and, and backbone uh, amides, for example, then we're going to have to add more sodium chloride to screen to better screen the interactions that are not favorable due to electrostatics to allow phase separation to occur. So the most sodium chloride that we have to add, that means that phase separation propensity has been decreased. And in every one of the examples where we've made mutations in the regions where we see increased NOEs, we see a decreased propensity to phase separate relative to the wild type, which is shown here in black. Now, we've also done controls. We've uh, made mutations in regions of the polypeptide chain, which are not so uh, telling in terms of uh, phase separation. So that, for example, if we look at these C-terminal regions here, uh, there are fewer uh, NOEs of an intermolecular variety, and therefore we would uh, postulate that they wouldn't be as responsible for phase separation. And indeed, mutations in these regions have absolutely no effect whatsoever on phase separation. So these NOE hotspots, therefore, are really representative, re representative of uh, interactions that occur which 
uh, involve particular regions, which we can now read out, uh, that are responsible for phase separation. We can also look at inter versus intramolecular interactions in the condensed phase, which give rise to phase separation. So again, in the condensed phase, looking at intermolecular interactions between black and red chains, uh, and in this particular case, we're looking at NOEs between uh, the side chain uh, protons of aromatic moieties and the backbone amides of glycines. You can see that we see intermolecular NOEs. Uh, and I also indicate here a numbers like plus 11, minus 11, plus 8, plus 15. These are uh, the distance in amino acid space between, for example, if we look at glycine 689, the closest aromatic is 15 residues away further towards the C-terminus. That's what the plus indicates. Now, again, we're looking at NOEs in an intermolecular interaction uh, in this particular case. But those are NOEs that involve uh, regions of the two uh, polypeptide chains that are quite far apart in a primary amino acid sequence. Here is a plus 25 uh, interaction. By contrast, if we look at intramolecular NOEs, so these are just the NOEs between the black chain, and here what we've done is in order to uh, ensure that predominantly the NOEs that we see are intra as opposed to intermolecular now, we're interested in intramolecular NOEs, we've diluted the black chain in a sea of molecules that are C12 and N14. And now you can see that we uh, do not observe uh, long-range NOEs. Most of the intramolecular NOEs are localized to intra-residue and sequential NOEs. And where we might see a, a, a very uh, large uh, NOE separated by, in this case, 18 amino acids, that likely reflects a very uh, small contribution from an intermolecular contact. So you can see that the intermolecular contacts uh, give rise to many more NOEs uh, than the uh, intra do. The intra NOEs are predominantly uh, going to be intra uh, residual or sequential. Now, up till now, what I focused on are NOEs uh, that provide us with information about the destination of magnetization. We know what residue is involved, but we really don't know which of the aromatics, for example, is involved in the uh, site of origination of the magnetization. And we'd like to get, of course, information not only about the destination, but also about the origination of magnetization. And here, a methyl groups have come to the rescue. I was quite surprised to learn that at least at a gigahertz, we have enough resolution, even in uh, an intrinsically disordered uh, protein, that the methyl groups, some of them anyways, uh, have enough resolution that we can separate one from the other. And one particular example is leucine 621. So we're going to carry out an experiment whereby uh, this is a methyl sensitive experiment. We record the carbon chemical shift of methyl groups, and then we transfer uh, the magnetization through space to the backbone amides. And this allows us to uh, record information about leucine 621 from one chain and backbone amides in another chain. So this is an intermolecular uh, NOE result, and you can see uh, that we have NOEs that go from the H delta 2 of leucine 621 all the way to valine 708, 80 residues away. Again, this is in an intermolecular contact context. So we have uh, many such NOEs. Uh, by contrast, if we carry out an intramolecular experiment, we have one really big NOE. This is an intramolecular NOE between leucine 621 uh, side chain and leucine 621 backbone. And if we plot the NOEs, both the intermolecular and the intramolecular from leucine 61, as a function of residue number, this is the backbone amide, you can see that the NOEs are distributed all across the sequence. So what that is telling us is that leucine 621 of one chain is going to slide along another chain. So we have chains that are sliding along one another, giving rise to contacts. By contrast, if one looks at intramolecular NOEs, they're more intense than the intermolecular NOEs. Note the scale here, 10 to the minus 3 versus 10 to the minus 4. So the intramolecular NOEs involving side chains are really very weak, but the intramolecular NOEs are going to be very much focused on the region uh, 
of leucine 621. So if we go down into the noise level, uh, again, you can see we have weak NOEs of an intermolecular variety, uh, but many of them, and the intramolecular NOEs are very much focused on uh, residues that are either leucine 621 or proximal uh, to it. And the same thing, for example, if we look at valine 610 and 708, now the two uh, valines, these two valines uh, are overlapped with one another so that the NOEs that we would get would either derive from the H gamma 2s of 610 or 708. But again, we see a range of intermolecular NOEs and very specific intra NOEs in the condensed phase that focus uh, in this particular case, intramolecular case, on either uh, 610 or 708. So a simple model really emerges in part by virtue of the data that we get from the methyl groups, whereby we have interactions between one position on a chain and all the other positions on another chain. So if I draw two chains where I highlight the arginine regions and the aromatic regions in yellow and pink respectively, then we have, if you like, one chain that slithers about another chain. There are interactions that occur. We know this by virtue of the fact that we see NOEs from one chain all the way throughout another chain. But there are regions of hot spots where the interactions are stronger than other regions. So that, for example, uh, this particular configuration might be longer lived than this configuration. And that gives rise to the pattern of NOE uh, hotspot intensities that we observe uh, in our uh, NOE profiles. So what we would like to do now is look at interactions using other spin relaxation modalities. And one modality that we can use is simply to measure backbone amide R2 values. Backbone amide R2 values and 15 uh, tr transverse relaxation rates are going to be reporters of interactions. And so what I show here in this upper panel are N15 R2s as a function of the uh, residue uh, number in Capron and recorded at a number of different concentrations of a dilute phase or the mixed phase, if you like. So this is non-phase separated sample with concentrations that range from 100 micromolar to 2 millimolar. So differences of a factor of 20 in concentration. And you can see that the pattern of uh, these R2 uh, profiles is really very similar, irrespective of concentration. In fact, it's identical to within a multiplicative factor that simply uh, represents the differences in viscosity that would be associated with having differences in concentration of a factor of uh, 20. And so, these interactions that we that manifest by virtue of increases in N15 R2s must be of an intramolecular nature because they're going to be concentration independent. What I show here are exactly the same profiles indicated here, but I've superimposed onto this graph here now the N15 R2s that we get from the condensed phase. These N15 R2 profiles, uh, these N15 R2 rates are much larger because of course the viscosity of the uh, mixed phase system is much less than the viscosity of the demixed condensed phase system. But if we multiply by the suitable, by suitable factors, these profiles, you can see that they are essentially identical. That is to say the N15R2 profiles of the condensed phase are very similar to that which we get in the mixed phase. Now again, the mixed phase profiles are representative of intramolecular interactions and the question is, can we say something based on this data that gives us information about the correspondence between interactions that exist in the mixed phase and those which exist in the demixed phases? So is there something we can learn from the fact that we get really identical profiles in both the mixed and demixed phases? And so what we did is as follows. We're going to look at the mixed phase for a moment. So this is the non-phase separated state, and we're going to make mutations again. We're going to make mutations where we see these humps. So we may make a mutation in this region here, this hump region, and in this hump region. And when we make the mutations, we're going to record in 15 R2s again, and we're going to compare those to the wild type situation. So if we make a mutation, say around position 620 or 660 actually here, in this case, you can see that there's a change in the N15R2. So the 
N15R2 of the mutant has decreased by three per second relative to the wild type. This is done at 100 micromolar concentration, where the uh, N15R2 in the wild type is six per second. So we've decreased by 50% that N15R2. We've gotten rid of this hump by making a mutation in this region. And similarly for other regions where there are humps. So we can get rid of the intramolecular uh, interactions. And then what we've done is we've taken these mutants and we've assayed for how this affects intermolecular interactions, the proxy of which is going to be phase separation propensity. If we decrease phase separation propensity with these mutants, that means we also decrease intermolecular interactions with these same mutants. And indeed, we find that where we, the positions where we make mutations that decrease the intramolecular interactions in the context of the mixed phase are precisely where we decrease the intermolecular interactions in the context of demixed phases. So there is some correspondence between interactions in the mixed phase, which then become the interactions in the condensed phase involving the same uh, residues, the same interactions. We are also interested in looking how post-translational modifications in the vicinity of hotspots might affect phase separation. You might argue that if you make a post-translational modification, you would prevent interactions from occurring. And if they're in the face in the, in the hotspot region, they would prevent phase separation. Well, it's known that Caprin-1 is going to be glycosylated and glycosylated in response to oxidative stresses. It wasn't known, however, where glycosylation occurs. This can be easily elucidated by NMR because we can record spectra in the absence and presence of glycosylation. And then we can look at CSPs which indicate that glycosylation occurs at the level of a pair of serines. This serine here, which is in a hotspot region for phase separation, another serine region here, which is a little bit removed. We can also conclude from the NMR study, the time course of glycosylation, that this serine here is gonna be the most important. And then we can do uh, the same uh, assays, the light scattering assays as a function of sodium chloride concentration to conclude that glycosylation is going to have a profound effect on phase separation and is going to uh, decrease the propensity to phase separate. And then finally, we can look and see what happens when ATP binds to hotspot regions. I showed you before that if we add a small amount of ATP, the effect is to enhance phase separation. And if we look at phase separation capability as measured through light scattering as a function of the concentration of ATP, you can see that as we add a little bit in the millimolar region of ATP concentration for several hundred micromolar concentration of caprin, we get an increase in phase separation propensity. Highlight scattering means lots of phase separation. We can confirm that by uh, fluorescence microscopy imaging. And then if we go to say 50 millimolar concentration in ATP, these blobs disappear, indicate that phase separation uh, has been eliminated. And so what we've done is experiments whereby we measure uh, the volumes of peaks in these so-called CON-based experiments, cone experiments with H-alpha detection. Again, uh, we look at ATP, uh, we add a little bit of manganese, and what we see if we have 70 millimolar in manganese, so that's the concentration of manganese where there's no phase separation, you can now see that in addition to ATP manganese binding to the arginine rich regions shown here, there is also binding to the aromatic regions, much more than there is when we just add a little bit of ATP that promotes phase separation. So by adding more ATP, we now get a physical basis for why this dissolves phase separation. So I'd like to conclude there by saying that I think that NMR can play a major role uh, in elucidating some of the key factors that are responsible for phase separation. And it, when combined with some of the more biological techniques and some of the less at atomistic but physical techniques like fluorescence microscopy really can provide a picture for how uh, phase separation might occur. Let me stop there by thanking the people who were involved this, in this work. Primarily, it was the work of a single uh, postdoctoral fellow who is both in my lab and, and Julie's lab. And I'd like to thank him and you for your kind attention. That was beautiful, <clears throat> Lewis, and I, I think it really demonstrates how 
by doing technology development for NMR, you can address really important biological questions. Um, so the presentation is open for questions. I see Christian Griesinger has a hand up. So go ahead, Christian. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Louis, you, you uh, mentioned um, intra and intermolecular uh, NOEs. Now, in principle, if you go to the more dilute phase where the intermolecular interaction should not play such a role, do you then replace them by intramolecular interactions? Right. So if you look at the dilute phase, what we see there are interactions which are very, very similar to those which we see uh, in the condensed phase, but in the intramolecular case. Okay. So intramolecular NOEs in the dilute phase, and it's predominantly intramolecular in the dilute phase. Of course, we do see intramolecular NOEs in the dilute phase as well. That's that's how that's how we got the hint to you know to to focus on certain residues, and we can push them a little bit through the addition of ATP. But what was somewhat surprising is that you know if you look at that, I took us out a slide because of, of, of time constraints, if you look at the, the, the sort of correlations that we get in the phase separated milieu for intra and compare that for what we get in, in the dilute phase for intra, they're, they're very, very similar. So I, I have a little trouble understanding that, the same with the exchange broadening being similar in the intra in the in the dilute phase compared to the condensed phase. In, 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 in the intermolecular interactions, there are different residues interacting than there are in the in the isolated in the dilute uh, sample so is it is it that intra interactions simulate the same kind of residue interactions that you have in the intercase how do you understand that right so it's an interesting question and if you look at you know some of my understanding and it's not complete but some of my understanding comes from this experiment here that hopefully you can see where you can, you know, you have certain, I think we can agree that, you know, this, the experiment where we basically look in the dilute phase as a function of concentration. And we see that we get the same R2 profiles and we get the same kind of blobs in the, in the profile. That indicates that we've got certain in, in intramolecular interactions, right? Because they're concentration independent. And, and we see similar sorts of profiles for the condensed phase, which we, on the basis of carrying out mutagenesis, conclude that that means that there's that, that there's a correspondence between some of the intra and some of the inter. And so the way that I explain that is, you know, fundamentally you have a protein molecule, and the protein molecule doesn't know the difference between intra and inter. It just sees the possibility for making interactions, and there are certain sticky regions uh, in the molecule. Um, for example, that involve, you know, aromatics. And so those are going to be sticky from the perspective of an, of an intra and from the perspective of, of, a, of an inter uh, in a set of interactions. And so that's why we see some of this uh, correspondence here uh, between uh, inter and intra. So that's sort of the way that I look at it, that, that you know, you, you have similar sorts of interactions because you know, it's the same sequence, whether it's intra or inter. Um, the interaction is missing. It's actually a, 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 like a homodimer, a homoligomeric interaction. And it's like heterodimeric. Yeah. Right, right. It's just, you know, I've called it a red chain and a, and a, and a black chain to indicate that we have different labeling. But, but it's, you know, you're, you're looking at the same chain. Yes. Um, I'm looking for other questions, but I, I'll ask another one. I always wonder about this question about what are the restraints on bound state lifetime in a transient interaction to actually see an NOE? I mean, in the limit, if it's very, very short bound state lifetime, you won't have an NOE. And so does this, what are the limitations there in terms of binding constant or bound state lifetime or ratios of populations? that allow you to see it in this case, to see the intermolecular NOEs, but wouldn't in a shorter lifetime interaction? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and of course it comes down to, you know, this interplay between populations and lifetimes. And so the answer in terms of lifetimes depends on populations and vice versa. I, again, I think it's important to, to, to understand that in this case, when we're dealing with, with you know, a highly dynamic system, 
um, we're talking about NOEs that are, as you can see here, uh, you know, not so much above noise. I mean, we're talking about, you know, they're four orders of magnitude smaller than the HSQC peaks. So, we're, and, and, and the NOEs in an intra manner are 10 times stronger than that, but still three orders of magnitude less. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can get some answer to that. Some answer to that would be provided by this factor of 10 difference. So in an in inter case, you're looking at NOEs between chains. Uh, they're 10 times weaker than an NOE within a given chain. So that gives you some information, you know, that tells you something about the, 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 the chain chain residency. On the other hand, um, you know, even in an intramolecular case, you have a bunch of segmental motion going on. Yeah. And so you're down by a factor of a thousand. So it's really, it's really hard for me to, I'd love to be able to deconvolve that information out, but it's difficult to do so because, you know, in this particular case, at least we have, you know, a few leucines where we have sort of typical information from a site A to a, you know, a donor site to an acceptor site. In most of the cases, because we just have no resolution whatsoever, we just have, you know, sort of all potential donor sites in the form of aromatic site chains to a particular site. It's still better than what we've been able to do before, but it adds an element of uncertainty because we don't know where that NOE is coming from. And I think what this experiment tells us where we can pinpoint leucine 621 and other experiments like that, where we have specific information about the methyls, is that indeed that information can be coming from the complete chain. Because although, you know, we're not in a, a state where we have reptation because we're not concentrated enough in protein. I mean, it's 28 millimolar, it's several hundred mg per mil. That's super concentrated, but it's not 80% protein, 20% water, it's inverted. So it still is a highly hydrated system. And so, um, you know, we don't, we, it's not reptating, but it is moving with respect to one another, and the interactions are coming from all over the place. I think the interaction has to be longer lived than the rotational correlation time of that internuclear vector, but then beyond that, it's modulated by lifetime, by, by populations, as you say. Yeah. So you can see pretty short lifetime states as you, as you are seeing. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, because, uh, you know, in, in, in principle, this represents, you know, each one of these NOEs is, a, is, is in a sense a different state, depending on how fine you wanted to find your state, because it corresponds to an NOE from leucine 621 to a backbone uh, amide. And, and you can see that you see NOEs, you know, from 621 to 708, and from 621 to 661, and from 621 to 632. So, and, and we've done experiments. There's no way that this is spin diffusion. We have experiments that unequivocally demonstrate that. So, this is, you know, interactions that manifest by virtue of, of many different states, if you want to define it that way. And some states are longer lived, and that's what gives that's what gives rise to the to the profiles that we see here with these humps. Well, the transfer to we, to some extent, the shorter lived species uh, win. So, in other words, if you have a weak interaction with a fast K off versus a tighter interaction with a slower K off, you can get more contribution in that transfer than a week from the weaker interaction. Um, and, and that might be at play here too. It might not be that you're biased towards the, uh, it's, it's just population driven really. Yeah, except I think that in this case, Anne, what we have is a situation where you know, everything is is just so fast. I mean, it, it's, you know, typically if you do a transfer energy experiment and you look at a small peptide and so, you know, you've got the, the, the intensity of the peptide to help you. And so you can see, you can see NOEs perhaps better than you would if, if, if you didn't have the same exchange kinetics and you were looking at a big protein, for example. But here we have something which is, is you know, the NOEs are so weak that it's, it's it's just super transient all the way through and we don't really have a we don't really have a, a, a state as you know one might call it that in the context of a of a, an of actual ligand protein interaction where the ligand binds and has a you know a long lifetime um 
Christian, did you have your hand up? Well, you, um, well, well I, I, I was just wondering, continuing this uh, discussion about the uh, quantitative interpretation of the of the NOEs, whether um, there is any way of potentially, or whether you have uh, thought about it. Um, I mean, um, of, of course, if, if, if two parts in a mol uh, of a molecule come together, I mean, you, you could interpret an NOE as low population of something very close or a little bit higher uh, um, population of something that's a little bit farther apart. And um, so, so, I mean, tr trying to discern these two, uh, two possibilities, I mean, do you see a way in doing that? You know, I have this discussion uh, with Julie all the time because she likes to use uh, uh, PREs in unfolded uh, states of proteins to get out information. And I've, you know, I've messed with trying to write programs to be able to do that. And I, I think you've hit the, you know, you've you've hit it right on the the, the the nail on the on the head. I mean, how do you really distinguish between those two situations? I mean, and and, and that's that's. I don't know that anybody has been able to do that in a really rigorous way. I mean, you can say, okay, I'm going to have lots of ensemble, you know, lots of members of the ensemble, and so take into account all of that. But then, you know, even the selection of of how you know, how you interpret the NMR data, right? Um, and I think we have a, a similar sort sort of situation here, which is why we kind of resort, you know, even even interpretation of the NMR data where you see those, you know, you see more NOE intensity. Do you interpret that as actually indicating a hot spot, or is that due to dynamics that that maybe doesn't indicate something about distances? Or and and of course, there's a correlation between dynamics and distance. And the only way that I was able to kind of rescue myself from that question that bothered me uh, was to basically, you know, through this mutagenesis and then correlate the mutagenesis with, a, you know, the appearance of phase separation or not. To try to see, you know, correlate the NOEs with. The ability to phase separate, which in turn is related to intermolecular contacts, uh, and 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 to uh, interpret the NOEs in that manner, because I think it's actually really complicated. So, we, in the interest of time, we should should move on to the next. I, I should say that same question is relevant even in globular protein structure determination about short distances and, and lifetimes. Um, but even more relevant here. <laughs> <laughs> 